Well, hey there, everyone. This is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. Uh, I am bringing to you a video that I've been hinting at and talking about for quite a while, and that is a video on troubleshooting uh, issues that you may have with your vintage sewing machine. And while all sewing machine models vary somewhat, <clears throat> and there may be things that are unique to those models, a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is pretty, uh, you know, pretty much is universal. You can apply this to most of the vintage uh, models that those of you would be sewing on. And you know what's interesting? I've often told people that it's really hard to break a vintage sewing machine unless it's being abused. Uh, <clears throat> even the parts on these machines, they rarely, if ever, truly just break um, and and uh, stop working on you. It can happen, but it's unusual, unlike with the newer machines that are so poorly made. Now, this is uh, the white 164 model. It's a two-tone gray and white. It is uh, from the same era as those turquoise and white two-tone zigzag white sewing machines I've been um, the white brand machines that I've been doing videos on. And so I'm going to go through sort of a list. Again, it's not exhaustive. You folks may think of things you uh, don't see here, and I'd, I'd love for you to add in and chime in um, as you watch the video. Maybe I'm uh, leaving some things out. It's very possible. But I wanted to share with you a number of things that I have noticed over time that people run into. And the good news is, Almost always, and I mean almost like 99% of the time, your machine is not broken. Usually something has gotten uh, out of alignment. Something is not set right. Remember, sewing machines have settings. Even this model, which is a straight stitcher, there are a number of settings a sewing machine needs in order to perform the way it was designed to. And because vintage sewing machines do not have computer software and um, computer brains, if you will, they can't beep at you or, or yell at you when, you when you're not doing something correctly. But there's a good side to that because we don't have to rely on software that eventually will be unsupported. Uh, and as of now, there are lots of, uh, of the earlier modern sewing machines that you can't use anymore. They don't function because the software is, uh, is gone back. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to do, again, this is sort of called troubleshooting. And the good news here is it's, you may laugh at yourself sometimes. I've done this. I've caught myself thinking, okay, what is going on here? What is wrong? As it turns out, the machine has been patiently waiting for me to uh, get a setting properly uh, in place so that it can do what it was meant to do. So I'm going to start, and actually the first place to look believe it or not, is your sewing machine manual. Now, these two books here, these actually go to uh, the zigzag version of this machine, but, but the principle is the same. So, uh, in part of your manual, depending on the year and, and how old your machine is, you may see a thread path guide, and it has instructions, and I'm, I'll try to, to get a little closer look so you guys can see. Now, keep in mind, some of these are illustrated better than others. And there are times when you may look at this and you may still want to you know, go online. Maybe you have uh, someone who has threaded this machine before and they're gonna show you in a, in a video, right? And of course, the same thing will go for things like winding and loading your bobbin. And that's really important. And I'm gonna touch on some of these things. There's also uh, sometimes <clears throat> a section in your sewing machine manual on uh, troubleshooting. Now, here you will see instructions on how to clean and oil. This, in this case, it's the shuttle. That's one area that a lot of people often neglect, mainly because they forget that they're supposed to do it. But your manual will have all sorts of little helpful hints because sometimes you may have forgotten uh, the way certain parts of your machine run. Maybe you haven't been paying it much attention and love for a while and and you have to kind of refamiliarize yourself. Uh, I restore so many different models of sewing machines that I often do this because unless it's a machine that I know from just many, many uh, repeated restoration attempts, I know that I will sometimes check back just to be sure that I remember if it's a, you know, if it's a, 
if it's an unusual machine. Some, some machines do things differently. Um, and here, in the very, usually it's in the back, and you can see this on this white brand. If you look closely, you will see, let's get this to zoom for us. This is called a trouble chart. Trouble chart. And of course, it will list on the left here. It lists what kind of trouble are you having? Skipping stitches, irregular stitches, uneven, and so forth. And then on, it says probable cause, okay, but there can be others. So this is not, you know, this is not the be and end all, but it's a really good, useful tool. At least you can screen out what it is not, uh, what is not the source of the problems. And then, of course, on the right here, it will show you, hey, here's the correction step you need to take. And these are all things you can try. Again, they're not guaranteed, but isn't it nice to have something like this? And you will often be able to, to troubleshoot, even from the manual, and it will help you uh, solve a lot of those issues. So, um, <clears throat> as many of you know, in fact, I often get questions, when you get a new machine, it may not be obvious to you how to thread the machine. And again, let's say you have the manual, go to the manual. You can do it on your own, but if you're not familiar with threading the machine, keep in mind, every sewing machine, and even within a brand, say the white brand or the Singer brand, for example, every model can have a different thread uh, formula or thread path, okay, the path that the thread is moving. And I've got this machine set up with a dark thread, so hopefully you can see a little bit of it. But again, with this particular machine, the thread spool is in the back. And it comes, it, you take the thread off the spool, you hit the first thread guide here where my, where my finger's tapping, and then you come over to the front. You come down, in, there is actually, I'm going to zoom in here because I really want you guys to see this little area. If you see over here to the right, sometimes uh, a machine, this of course is the tension assembly for your, uh, for your upper thread tension. Uh, and over here is like a little, it's like a little wing, if you will, or a little, um, uh, for lack of a better term, it's just like a little um, resting area. It's sort of shaped like a little bell. And what you'll do is you'll place your thread against it and then slide it in. And that's kind of a way to help make sure you're between the two tension discs. If you have one of the really old machines, like some of the old singers, you don't even have that. You don't even have numbers. But I'll, I'll go over when I talk about those machines. There's a way to get your tension set. So don't worry if you don't have a numbered dial. You don't have to have one. Our ancestors sewed for probably a century without having numbered dials, although they are nice to have. Now, here's a little tip when you are um, going to be threading your machine. Let's get us back here. So, you'll notice, and you can see this when you're standing above looking at your tension discs. Right now, the presser foot, which has the, the uh, sewing foot attached, is, is down. It's actually pushing down. When I lift it up, I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, there's some movement right here. Let's zoom in again. Zoom in even a little bit further. Okay, now watch the white dial and see if you see any movement. Let's get it to focus. Now watch. Don't know if that's picking up. When, when this happens, when you lift your presser bar, what's happening is it is taking the tension off the discs, and that is what you want when you go to thread your machine. Because if you thread the machine when the presser foot's down, and the tension, whatever the tension setting is, once that tension is back on those discs, you may be um, inviting issues with your upper tension. Not always, but it can happen. So keep that in mind. Now, here, uh, after you have come around with your, uh, through your tension discs, there is, of course, a check spring. And let's see if you guys can see, but there's a little check spring here. And this one is fairly easy to recognize. As the thread comes around, it comes underneath that check spring and it's going to uh, connect to the thread, which is now going up to the take-up arm. And of course, I'll be doing, some of you, if you're new, you may not even know what some of these terms are. The take-up arm is this piece up top that, and you'll see it moving up and down as the needle does and it's pulling the thread. Remember, the thread is moving through the machine as you're sewing. And here you have another guide. 
uh, you want to be inside this little uh, clip, U-shaped clip. Then there is yet another thread guide. And then there is another one right here. And this one's not even connecting. Then, let's get zoomed in once again. You will have yet another thread guide, which is here, at least on this machine, right next to the needle clamp. Of course, the needle clamp has your, your, your uh, set screw to tighten your needle when you install it. Now, take a look, because let's say, for example, right now, this thread is not on that, that little uh, needle thread guide. And I'm going to zoom in even more. I really want you guys to see it. So right here is a little thread guide. And you often, they look like little curly cues. Uh, they're usually wire that's been twisted or turned. And then the thread is supposed to go behind that little thread guide. And the thread is held in place with this. And this is really important because if you don't hit every one of the thread guides, the machine that you have, whatever it is, was engineered to create thread tension so that when it comes to the needle and it's going in, it is ready to form at least uh, on the top tension, the top, pardon me, <clears throat> the top tension is currently set properly. If you miss one of these thread guides, and you might be in a hurry, maybe you weren't paying attention, right? You miss the thread guide and uh-oh, all of a sudden you're having stitching issues. That is exam an example of one of the areas that can create problems for you when you are uh, trying to get your machine to work and you don't understand. It's either not forming a stitch at all, it's creating a big little nest, a ball of thread, or maybe your stitches are just not looking right. There are many reasons for that. Uh, right now, the tension on this white, I've already gone through this one, and it's really, it's quite beautiful. I mean, it's perfect. Um, there, there's nothing overly tight or loose about it. But that is a, that's a common thing that can happen on sewing machines when you are, uh, you're having issues with your stitching. And of course, tension can be uh, an issue. Now, of course, as many of you know, uh, you have two kinds of tension. You have upper and lower in a sewing machine. And of course, your lower tension um, is regulated by your bobbin case. And your bobbin case, this is a vertical class 15 machine from the 60s. And so, of course, the bobbin case looks like this. They kind of look like a little bird's egg with a, with, a, with a little horn on the top or an ear or whatever you wish to call it. And of course, you have your bobbin. When you take the bobbin case out, you need to pull on this little latch to let it, to, to loosen it. If you don't, um, it, will, it will fight with you. Now, I'm taking the bobbin out here to illustrate a couple of things. The first thing is that you'll notice sometimes people take their bobbin case out, and this one's in gorgeous shape. This machine did not get used much in its life, and I could tell. Um, when I restored it, I, of course, went through all of the systems because even a machine that looks really, really pretty, it's not dirty, it, they can still have issues. So you, you, don't, you don't make assumptions about any vintage machine. You really have to go through the whole thing. One thing to mention here, sometimes people will either break a thread or they'll stop sewing for some reason. And you'll have your bobbin case. And of course your bobbin is out, but you've got this hanging thread tail. And you'll notice part of it is going uh, where it entered the bobbin case. And then part of it is here, okay? The direction of thread going through a bobbin case is always, when you're threading your bobbin, and I'll show this to you in a moment, when you're threading the bobbin, the thread comes off the, excuse me, the bobbin case, the thread comes off of the bobbin, goes into the bobbin case, and it goes in, and it comes out, and it hangs. If you ever have a thread tail hanging on a bobbin case, and you need to get it out of there because you're going to reload uh, your bobbin into the bobbin case, always remember to pull the thread the same direction that you loaded it, which is the direction I'm pulling, right? This is the direction I loaded it, and I want to remove that little scrap the same way. You do not want to pull backwards 
backwards meaning opposite of the way you threaded the bobbin case because this bobbin case you don't really notice it but inside here are uh, small tensioning springs and they are crucial to your lower bobbin tension and the springs like it when you pull the thread in one direction which is the loading direction if you go backwards uh, and some of you have done it. Gosh, I've done it before. You can get away with it, but you can also cause um, the weakening of your bobbin case and shorten its lifespan. So just, just be kind to your bobbin case and follow the rules and you'll be okay. Now, this is a very typical and common class 15 bobbin case. So again, I have my thread hanging to the right or clockwise. And again, this information should be in your manual. I have loaded these types many times, so I know which direction it goes. But you might not. So you can always look uh, in the manual. But let's say I've got the bobbin case. Okay, I'm right-handed, so I'll take the bobbin case in my left hand. I'm going to put it here. And now you're going to see, if you look really closely, hopefully I have a good light for this, there's a little notch right down at the lower edge, let's see if I can point to it right here. It's a little, little small here, but right there, there's a little notch, and it's very important in terms of that direction. So remember, I had the 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 thread is coming off clockwise direction. It's coming now. I'm going to double back, go through that slot, right, and I'm going to follow it around, and the thread is going to come back around, and it's going to sort of land in that little. Uh, little valley there and then I'm going to drape it like a little ponytail right here and that's how I'm going to hang it now if I just the, the bobbin's going to plop right out but if I hold this spring out it's going to keep my bobbin in place and I'm going to take take this down first thing I'm going to do is <clears throat> there we go had to get the uh, needle thread out of the way so now I'm going to keep holding that spring. I've got my thread tail and I'm going to place the bobbin case onto the drive shaft of the shuttle. Now in here, let's make sure it will show up. There is a notch in the very top of the face plate of your shuttle hook. And that notch needs to line up with the little horn or the little ear on the bobbin case. You can press it in. You can also hold this. Let's hold this open and push in, okay? Now, if you don't install it properly, it will simply roll out. It'll just roll around like a, like a little ball on the floor, but don't worry about that. Uh, try it again, try reinstalling it if you don't install it right the first time. So, these are examples of things that can cause problems. What else can cause problems? This is an area of the machine I often see when I'm, when I'm overhauling sewing machines People will sometimes clean some areas, but they don't always clean this area. This is the area, along with the feed dogs up top, that can collect lint. I mean, all threads, whether they're natural or synthetic, they shed little microfibers that turns into lint. And if you get lint to build, lint will eventually build up here. They All sewing machines do. Even the new ones, it happens to them. So you will need to take uh, one of those nice lint brushes that I have uh, talked to you folks about, the ones that I really like, such as this one. And of course you're going to want to clean in this area when you have the bobbin case out. And if, the other way that you will clean is you will remove your needle plate um, and you will clean around the feed dog area. Okay, And you definitely want to do that. You don't have to do it every time you start a new project it really you have to kind of use your eyesight to decide how much lint is in there but you definitely want to keep that area clean um, one other thing to keep in mind is if you look at the back of the machine here let's pan up just a bit okay you will see underneath the sewing spool of thread, you will see a little red washer. In fact, I meant in my parts video to talk to you guys about this. Your machine would have come with a felt washer on the spool pin. This has two because it can do double needle sewing. Now, 
it doesn't matter what color the washer is. Uh, if my machines that I restore don't have washers, who knows, they've gotten lost, or um, I always put new ones and replacements on there, and there's a reason. Washers are very helpful, even back in the old days, uh, when you had thread that was put onto wooden spools. Today, thread is either put onto plastic or sometimes even styrofoam. And any of you who've tried to sew without a washer will know that without that, the spool will often bounce up and down, uh, sometimes um, pretty intensely, and it will fly off of your machine. And that definitely will put a put a uh, crimp in your style when you're trying to sew. So again, these are a few of the issues that can happen with things like thread tension. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to show you when it comes to the thread tension is has to do with the direction you are threading your needle. So let's say, okay, I've hit all of my thread guys, I'm good, I've followed the, followed the rules, I've got the machine set up, and now it's time to thread your needle. Now, a lot of modern machines, most of them, and even some of the, uh, uh, as early as some of the 70s Kenmores, and I believe even the 1950s uh, Singers, the Slantomatic machines, once you get to the 400, 500 series, uh, the 500 series I know for sure, you, you thread your needle front to back, okay? Now, this particular machine, like many of the uh, Class 15 clones, this was made in Japan for the White Sewing Company. Uh, they thread, in this case, uh, from the left to the right. So the thread comes down uh, in the thread guide and then you're gonna thread the eye of the needle this way. If you're not sure, look to the manual. If you don't have the manual, look to see the last needle, if there's a needle in there, and feel for the little groove. We'll talk about needles in another, uh, another video. Just made myself another promise on a video. Um, but there's a groove side to your needle. The groove side is always going to be the side that your thread is, is um, coming in from. And if that's the groove side, you'll know you have it. Uh, I'm going to talk in a different video about needle installation because that can be a major issue. But for the purposes of, uh, of this video, suffice it to say that you've got to have the thread going in. And hopefully you can see this dark get out of there. Uh, this dark thread here I'm holding in my thumbs, but notice it goes from here and it comes toward my right, from the left to my right. If you thread it backwards, the machine will not sew properly. It will create a mess and you will be asking yourself, why is this happening? So it can be something as simple as that, okay? Uh, while we're on the topic of the needle and thread tension, Let's take a look. I'm going to let you guys see me. I'm going to loosen the set screw here and I'm going to pull the needle out. Now, just a couple of things to say about needle installation. Okay? What you're going to want to do is remember we were talking about the grooved side of the needle. And remember that a needle, if you look at it from the top, it's not gonna show up on camera, I don't believe, but it's shaped like the letter D, okay? And so the letter D is, uh, it basically has that shape. And what you want, the flat side of the needle, the rest of it is round, okay? You want that flat side facing the direction that your thread needs to go because opposite the flat side of the needle is the groove side. If you put the needle in and you don't have the flat side lined up on, on, a, on a flat plane in the right direction, that can influence everything from your thread tension to your timing. So be sure, and it's a little hard to see sometimes, you may need a light to reflect on it, but what you want to see is that flat side of the needle, your manual will tell you, hey, install the needle with the flat side facing the right. Some of the singers it will face to the left, and then many of other machine it will face to the back. But do what it says. And don't be in a hurry when you do this, because if you are, uh, you, will, you may not like the results. So right now, I've got the, the needle clamp open, and I have good natural light here, thankfully. So I'm going to take my needle, I'm going to install it in the, the uh, opening where the needle goes at the needle clamp. Now, let 
when I install this, um, it's very important, guys. This is also going to affect your tension and your stitches. Let me move my hand here so you can see hopefully a little better. Notice that needles, when you insert them, you insert them up. Some people either get in a hurry or they put the needle up and they let go of it while they're doing something else like tightening the set screw. Do not do that. When you put the needle in, be sure that you insert it all the way and until it, you can feel a definite, you're all the way in and it stops, right? You've met a solid surface there, you can't go any farther. Now hold that needle. Don't let it go, don't let it drop down. And then of course, I'm gonna turn my set screw and snug it. Uh, don't ever over torque it, just get it nice and snug tight. Okay, that's important. Why? <clears throat> because the position that the eye of the needle is in, when it comes down to meet the bobbin, uh, or the shuttle hook down there is very crucial. If you don't install, install the needle in its proper position vertically, it can ruin your stitch and more importantly you can break a needle, it can damage the needle, it can damage your hook down below, and it can throw off the timing. So again, this little thing can make a huge difference. Um, but anyway, that's essentially what I wanted to say to you all about thread tension. It is one of the most common causes of issues. Let's zoom back out a little bit here. And uh, it's one of the things that can really mess with your stitches. And again, it's not that the machine's broken, it's just waiting for you to attend to the settings it needs. And of course, if you have a uh, numbered tension dial, that's great to have. There's a plus and a minus sign on, on uh, dials like these. Plus, of course, is raising the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the tension on your upper thread. Now, you may need to adjust this. Some machines are more finicky than others. Normally, if you have the tension set and you are using the same thread and a similar weight of fabric, I've been known to leave the tension set on my machines for a long time. If you make uh, changes in the weight of the thread, you go from a thinner or a thicker thread or vice versa, or if you change the weight of your fabric, and if it's a pretty, pretty good difference in that new fabric weight, uh, you may even have to change out the size of the needle. If you don't, that can cause problems. Um, you want your thread and your needle to be uh, in sync. I'll talk about that in the, in the needle video. But this is, these are the main things I wanted you guys to see. It only takes one little um, error on something like a thread guide and your whole sewing machine goes off. Once you have used a machine for a while, honestly, you, you really, you will know it so well, you could even do it, you know, without even looking at the manual. You will know the machine. It's just like a car. I use that metaphor a lot. A lot of times when you get a new car, you don't know where the controls are, you don't know how to operate it, but by the time you've been driving the same car for a while, you pretty much know its ways, you know what you should be doing with it, um, and, uh, you know, the sewing machines are no different if you think about it. So again, guys, this is part of a series about troubleshooting. I didn't want to make a really, really long video this time. I'm going to try to do this in little, in little, uh, a series of videos so you guys can hone in. Maybe that's the, the issue you want to see, but I'll have other troubleshooting videos. There are quite a few things that we can look at to help um, solve problems and, 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 and make for a happy machine and a happy, uh, a happy person when they're trying to use it. So anyway, thanks for watching folks. If you think of anything I missed when I was talking about threads, um, uh, let me know and uh, I will look for your comments and we'll I'll get started on the next uh, video in this series. Thanks so much.